Welcome. My name is William Cuskin, and it's a delight to have you along for our Going the Distance teacher discussion series. This is actually our seventh, our seventh meeting, and I have just been blown away by the depth of insight, the quality of presentation, and the, the really adventurous sense of discussion. So I'm delighted you're here, either in person or watching in the recorded archived videos. That is just wonderful. The overriding question that I've put to all our presenters is, is not simply how we can technically move through the challenges of the pandemic and the fall 2020 semester, but really how these challenges open up larger themes and opportunities around teaching at CU Boulder. My feeling is that we have a tremendous opportunity in front of us, an opportunity to have a much needed, long overdue conversation about the classroom. So I can think of no better person to lead this conversation than our speaker today, Diane Sieber. Diane began in arts and sciences in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. She is the author of Historiography and Marginal Identity in 16th Century Literature. She is a scholar of Don Quixote, of teaching, of technology. She is currently director of the Herbst Program for Ethics and Society, and she is also a president's teacher's teaching scholar. But when I think about Diane, the only thing that comes to mind, uh, the umbrella that comes to mind, is that she is blessed with a truly Renaissance perspective. She is one of the most inspiring intellects I know on this campus. And that, that intellect is both looking towards history and thinking about the tremendous transition that printing brought to us, but it's also forward-looking. It's looking at technology, on, in, in social applications of technology, in programming, and in the way we think now. And in that, she is a true humanist, because humanism, humanism is past-looking and forward-looking. It is, it is a sense of knowledge that spans the globe and history. And Diane is just truly amazing in that she possesses a playful way of covering the past and the present. She is a, a scholar. She is an administrator, director of the Herps program, but she has served in, in many, many roles and she is a teacher. So I'm failing to do justice with to Diane's herb, but I can't I can't fault myself because it is so grand, it covers so much that truly we're dealing with someone here who has a capacious curiosity and who uses that to drive herself and the university forward. So I'm gonna pipe down. It gives me truly great pleasure to introduce Diane Sieber on the topic engaging students both in person and online. Thank you. Wow, and now it's time for your anticlimax. <laughs> okay, so um, what, I, what I wanted to do is throw together some thoughts um, and particularly some, some very pragmatic approaches that you might think about for engaging students. And uh, two things I wanna say first. One is um, in the tech industry these days, or certainly in the ethics profession, the word engagement is a really bad word because it pretty much translates to addiction. Engagement is the metric used by Facebook and by Instagram and by TikTok and all sorts of other. Um, but I would argue that engagement is absolutely the key thing that we need to be thinking about in education. Um, if we could only make learning as addictive as TikTok, um, I think we would really uh, be getting somewhere. 
The second thing is, um, I'm going to be talking about ways to engage that work both in person and online. And to some degree, um, uh, going online has allowed me to, to use things that I've used in the classroom, but make them way better. And it's also given me a feedback loop so that there are things that I've now tried online that I'm trying to figure out how to make work in person. So um, I think these are, um, these are very interactive categories. And um, I'm happy to engage in open discussion about what you do if you're a hybrid. That is, if you have some students remote and some students in person, because that does complicate things a lot. But I think hopefully I'll have some suggestions that work for all three possibilities. So I'm going to leap right in and say one of the things that I've done for 20 some years is to start class with a puzzle. Um, when students walk into my classroom, there's something on the board, there might be music playing, um, there might be something projected, something's going on, and they know when they walk into the room that they're already meant to start trying to figure out what it is. And this is really easy to duplicate in an online class. You know, you show up five minutes before class starts, you put up a slide, uh, you play music, you uh, show them an equation and a work of art. Um, and anybody who shows up early, uh, actually what it, what's interesting is the people who start to show up earlier because there's a puzzle. Anybody who shows up early is already thinking about the topic of the day. Um, and, and the puzzle could be, what does this thing have to do with today's class topic? Or what do these two things have to do with each other is a really great one. I mean, for example, um, Baroque architecture and music and image and sound. Um, most people come up with, yeah, too many notes, too many filigrees. Um, or uh, an example of a, of a helix spiral complex and the mathematics behind how you build something really interesting. Um, there, are, there are tons of different ways that you could think about adapting puzzles to work in your teaching environment. So um, engage students by starting them before class starts by giving them something to do and something that contributes to your topic. Um, another thing that I do a lot in uh, my in-person classes, and it turned out to be an absolute salvation when I went online, was um, doable at home assignments like paper prototyping. Um, have students use found materials um, and, and make things and then they can show them. Um, give them two minutes each to present their prototype um, have them produce something like um, a provocatype, um, which I'll actually, I was going to show you now, but I'll show you in a minute. Like have them come up with a prototype that's just meant to anger people or meant to make them say, but wait, what about privacy? Or, um, and see how provoked people can get. And that's another way to shake class up a little bit if you're remote instead of all together in person. Um, Something else I want to say kind of up front, um, I use a lot of classroom assessment techniques known as CATS. Um, so that's regular feedback that's non-graded that gives you a sense of how the class is going and how students are following what you're doing, whether they got the point. Um, and so uh, there are all sorts of different ways you can, you can administer a classroom assessment technique. The most common is everybody take out a piece of paper in the classroom and write a one minute paper, say the muddiest topic that you heard, say the, the most important point that you picked up from the class, things like that. Um, but in fact, I stopped using paper years ago and started using uh, Google Forms so that I can push them a classroom assessment uh, question as they leave the classroom and they have the rest of the day to answer. Because I'm really interested in bridging what they learned in the classroom and the, the other spaces of their lives. If they can actually think about something and apply it outside of the classroom, um, I have a feeling that that's gonna have a greater impact than just having them spit something back to me during class. Um, so um, you can do minute papers, memory assessments, directed paraphrasing, like you know, take this one idea and, and tell me what it means in your in your own words one sentence summaries of what happened in class uh, real world applications go out and find an example and post a picture or student generated test questions which will show up on tests so that they've actually started to contribute on a daily basis to uh to the the knowledge 
base that they're going to be uh, quizzed on. Um, I just wanted to show you what that might look like. Um, here's a Google form for a one minute paper. Um, as soon as they walk out of the classroom, I send this to all of their cell phones. What's the most important point you learned today? That's required. Um, and what one question do you wanna ask about what we discussed today? Submit, that's it. Um, it's not graded, but I get all the feedback immediately and I'm able to think through, um, did they actually get what I thought was important or did they pick up on some minor thing that I'm horrified they thought was important? Um, this is a good way to calibrate um, your tone, your approach, uh, how well you're communicating based uh, compared to how well you think you're communicating. Um, here's another example. This is directed paraphrasing in a real world application. The question was, um, let's see, hint, for this entry, your audience is your grandmother. That's who you're writing to. Explain the concept of the theatrical self. It's a sociological term that has a lot to do with how we present ourselves in multimedia situations. Um, and so that's a paraphrase. And then uh, list three of yourselves in their context. That's a real world application. How does this concept apply to who you are personally? Um, it goes just to me, everybody else doesn't see it, but here's what's actually quite interesting about it. Um, since you're using a Google form, it shows up in a Google spreadsheet and you can actually look at everything in real time. If you have a very large class, you can scan it really quickly. And, and, and pretty quickly you'll see if the points you made got across or if you need to explain more, or if, for example, there's a great example that you could anonymously use to share with the rest of the class so that they know you actually read this. Um, these things allow students to feel like they are, pr they are producing something, they're being read and thought about by, by the instructor, and then they're becoming part of the teaching itself, and they can hear their own words show up. And that's actually a fairly important part of having some kind of impact on the classroom environment. Um, cats, by the way, also work with Zoom. Um, I use the chat feature for this. Um, so if you have students address a chat note privately to you, um, uh, and if you're recording, then you'll actually be able to keep all of their chat responses. Um, you'll have a permanent record of those posts, but you could ask in, you know, in the chat, everybody now please post directly to me, what's the single most important thing from the class? Um, this is really easy and a really great way to get them to try to consolidate their knowledge before they walk away. Um, and then I started thinking through Zoom, which back in March was a hated tool, uh, which actually became more interesting within weeks and I will confess something that I'm still puzzled by. I had a seminar. I was teaching a, a seminar in Don Quixote with uh, 18 engineering students. Um, it worked better in Zoom than it did in person. And I never expected that. And part of the reason was that uh, even in a small class, there are always a couple of students who simply won't talk. But in Zoom, they felt implicated. They knew they were watched. People who never spoke, spoke. Um, people who were divided out into break rooms with each other focused on the one person they're with instead of looking around the rest of the room. Um, there were all sorts of ways in which um, Zoom, if, if you change the framework of the class every 10 minutes or so, in which Zoom is more engaging potentially than an in-person class, even for a small group. So here are a couple of things that, um, that actually surprised me. Um, I use the poll feature a lot in Zoom. Um, it functions basically like a clicker. I've never been a huge fan of clickers myself, um, but uh, to some degree, being able to pre-set up some questions that you just send out a poll at different points in the class, it breaks up the attention. It causes students to produce something so they become more active so that they don't um, fade out. I usually load up a couple of poll questions in advance. And if I start noticing people waning, I will send out a poll question and they're all right back to paying attention. Um, it can be a concept test, like, you know, what, you know, what do you, what does this concept mean? A, B, C, D. It could be to solve a problem and select the right answer, just as you would do with a clicker in a classroom. Uh, or it could simply be to solicit student feedback. How's the pace? Um, do you like the direction we're going? Are, are you understanding what we're talking about? Can we move on? 
Um, and also you can use the poll feature to display results for them to see just like you can with clickers so that they can see where they fit in the, in the whole scheme of things. Um, I use the chat feature a lot. Orig uh, at, at the outset, I despise it because I hate the idea of something back channel distracting me while I'm trying to do something that's already kind of hard to focus on. However, using it in a directed way, for example, post a thought question and ask all of them to reply to it as they show up, like give them 30 seconds to a minute and have them reply to the question you asked them to think about for the um, at, during the last class. Um, again, you can solicit real-time classroom assessment um, if, you, if they post to you privately and then everybody doesn't see what they've done. But I think there are all sorts of different ways that I'm not even thinking of yet that you could deploy the chat feature to get students to feel like they're actively participating instead of just back channeling. Um, you can also say, all right, at this point I'm pausing, anybody who has a question, put it in the chat. And then you can see how many people have the same question. Um, so I think there are a lot of different ways that you can do that that are far less intimidating online than they are in person. Say you have a 400 person class. Most people aren't gonna raise their hands in that class. But a lot of people, if they see other people asking a question can plus one the question. And then you can see how many people really are confused. Um, I think my favorite thing in Zoom is breakout rooms. Um, I've always done group work in classes. Um, my colleague Scott Douglas uh, in Herbst uh, and director of, of the Engineering Honors Program is one of the most amazing experts ever at this. Um, he does things like have students turn to each other and for one minute say to each other simultaneously everything they know about a topic. Um, this, this seems silly, except actually it gets them all talking and they're enthusiastic and they're thrilled to be already doing something. Even if the faculty member, even if the instructor can't tell what it is they're saying. Um, I do a lot of uh, group work where every table in my classroom will get a different uh, puzzle or a different problem to solve or a different image to analyze. And then they will report out to the room after they've had a chance to discuss. But this also works incredibly well in Zoom breakout rooms. So um, in particular, if you're trying to do breakout groups in a classroom, um, you may have noticed how hard it is to convince students to not sit with the people they always sit with, to get them to go somewhere else. I mean, I've done things like hand out numbers and they have to go to the table that has their number, um, have students count off as they walk into the classroom and then they have to go to that group. Um, everything I've tried to get them to sit in different places actually is kind of um, easy to do on Zoom uh, because you can pre-establish groups. So you can pre-assign students so that you know they're always working with people they haven't worked with before. Uh, you can have uh, Zoom randomly assign students to groups. Um, you can name groups for different working topics and have them sign up for groups. Um, and uh, there are a bunch of things you can do with us. So for example, I like to use them as escape rooms. Um, I'm a big game person. Um, they uh, each go into their group, they all have a puzzle and they have to compete to solve it first, right? Um, it's really fun if you give them all the same puzzle, but you could give them different ones too, and then see who gets themselves out of the group first. Um, the puzzle should always have something to do with what you're trying to teach, obviously, but... Um, uh, doing things like that, that that allow for some competition, but they're not high stakes, um, engages a lot. Um, and then, you know, the standard think, pair, share kind of exercise that we've all done probably in class uh, works particularly well in Zoom. So give everyone a short problem for, say, 30 seconds to a minute to think through, then send them automatically into breakout rooms for five minutes. By the way, they'll drift at the beginning and not talk about the problem. So after a minute, send the problem again and they'll all get back on task. Um, and then randomize who reports out when they all come back. Because usually they will volunteer the same person over and over to talk for the group. Um, so for example, tell them the student who's traveled to the most distant place reports. The student who has the smallest pet reports. Just come up with things. Um, they don't call students out for their difference necessarily in a bad way, but that are a little bit silly and that help them feel like maybe there's a reason that they're being chosen to speak for everybody besides the fact that they always do. 
Um, a couple of other things I do a lot in breakout groups. Um, I teach a number of classes that try to look at the, at the ethics of future use of current and emerging technologies. So I do a lot of things like use futures wheels where um, each group uses the whiteboard function. Um, they'll write a technology represented as T in the center. Uh, they'll write four possible futures for that technology around that rim. And then potential second order consequences of those futures around that rim. And then what if multiple variables in this diagram all were to be true at once? Um, interestingly, uh, maybe 10 years ago in doing this, somebody invented basically Tinder, which then happened later, but it was fascinating that students were able to foresee not only that that might exist, but what its potential ethical problems were. Um, this is a great way to get students to start um, trying to think uh, freely as opposed to being really concerned about making the right choice giving the right answer. Um, this I mentioned earlier, provocatyping, um, presenting each group with, with something that they have to look at and think through like, oh, I don't want to have a chip embedded in my hand unless it gives me special VIP act access to a club in Barcelona, which is actually what this chip was for. Um, but then what if it could be read by other people and third party readers, but then, so in other words, you get them to start thinking about um, if, uh, if all of our uh, vehicles nationwide become electric, how do we decide who gets priority at an electric charging station? Um, what if everybody has an ID that gives them a rank that allows them access? Well, who then should have priority? Is, should it be a doctor? Uh, should it be a teacher? Um, what are the different results of people having different priority based on social credit factors like um, are, are they, is it a felon? Um, is this somebody uh, who's, uh, who's not paid all of their traffic tickets, things like that. So just presenting groups with these open-ended challenges then helps them to come back and refocus very specifically on material, technical material that you want them to learn. A couple of other cool Zoom things. Um, I use the whiteboard feature a lot. I have a tablet, so I do use a stylus and I use the whiteboard for diagrams to outline ideas, um, things like that. Um, but you can do that to show them real time problem solving um, to get them to co collaborate in breakout groups like I just mentioned. Um, and also to get them to share their work publicly so they can use the whiteboard and then share it um, so that everybody else can see what they came up with. Um, you can also have use the camera to share an equation or a drawing, like say, all right, everybody all at once show your drawing. And it's really interesting to see how different those are. Um, I love making them draw a freehand map of the world because they're also wrong, um, but they get a good laugh out of how little they know about where things are in the world. A um, couple of other things that you can do in Zoom that you, you literally cannot do in person. Um, you can use the change background feature to reflect all sorts of things. Um, you know, I think um, this, this depends very much on what kind of uh, technology is available to your students at home. Um, if they're on campus, obviously, they're, they're going to have a much better bandwidth and they'll be able to do this more easily. So obviously, all of these things are in context. Um, but you could have them, you know, our topic for next class is, you know, Blade Runner. Um, so pick, pick a background that reflects this or um, have them show something about who they are by saying, you know, what's your favorite sci-fi? Show that next class. What's your favorite movie? Show that next class as your background. Um, with a large group, um, I've had them switch their backgrounds from red to green. Um, to just go ahead and keep a red and a green background. And then if you are showing a grid view, you have a really quick, they all can see very quickly. Um, how many people agree or disagree? How many people said yes or no to a question? So it's actually a kind of interesting way to do that. Um, to relax and refocus, um, play I Spy, right? Tell them all to come up with some weird image and then we can do I Spy uh, with each other for five minutes while we refocus. Um, in a 50 minute class, I tend to change everything up every 10 minutes. In an hour and 15 minute class, 
uh, that's so hard on Zoom, right? Um, I tend to do a big break in the middle, like five minutes, 10 minutes bio break and come back. Um, but also I still change things up. So, you know, playing some games or having them in your back pocket is a, is a good thing to, to be ready for. Um, I also use the annotate feature a lot and I have students use it um, in Zoom so that you can draw on an image or you can highlight a text or a map. Um, so uh, I do a lot of cartographic type things in my teaching and I can you know, show them the path through something or how to reach something or the proximity of something to some, something else. Um, and again, you know, with a tablet that's easy, if you have a separate Wacom tablet, you can do it. It just takes practice to not look like a two-year-old when you're drawing with one of those. Um, and, you know, Zoom has let me bring in experts so often that I could not get to come to a regular class. I couldn't get their parking permit. I couldn't have them come in for just 10 minutes. Um, and being able to record that so students can see it later if they miss class, because otherwise they'll never see it, is I think a really great fact that um, we haven't really solved in person yet. Um, I used to use Google Hangouts in class to bring people to the classroom um, and things like that, but this, this, seems to, this seems to really capture them. A um, couple more things, and then, sorry, this is like a giant fire hydrant moment for you, but I'll, I'll shut up shortly. A um, couple more thoughts. Um, if, if your class is in Canvas, which I think most classes on campus will be this fall, um, one of the great things about Canvas is it allows you to organize your class in very specific ways. The biggest problem with this is it's almost impossible for students to understand your vision of the course. They see modules, sometimes those are released to them individually. It's very hard to get a big arc. So make a map. Um, you know, I, I drew mine as a cartoon map um, in the style of XKCD, but you can try to figure out how do you see your course and how can you help students to see your course that way. I embed this on the front page of my Canvas site and it's clickable so they can go to any part of the course from it. Um, that's using um, HTML code and CSS, but um, you can also just post an image that they can refer to so that they always know where they are. Or you can always edit it at the beginning of every class. You can have a you are here image uh, and, and have them understand that that's where they're going and where they've come from. Um, I also, I think it's really great whether you're in person or remote to pair everything with Google Docs. Um, to allow students to do collaborative work. Um, one of the most successful things over time that I've really enjoyed doing is collective exam reviews. Um, my students all get a review sheet a week before any exam and it's online and they all contribute. So they gain social capital, they help each other, they learn by explaining things to other people. Um, I have TAs or I can moderate so that I can see if they have something totally wrong and I can fix it before they, they set it in concrete by putting it wrong on a test. Um, so I think there are all sorts of really interesting ways to make their learning visible and to have them actively contribute to a collective knowledge. Um, also, I pair all of my classes with a conversation app like Slack so that we can do a lot of work um, in, in real time or asynchronously. I don't, I don't really like the discussion groups in Canvas. They're kind of kludgy. So um, thinking through a couple of other things that you can use um, that will make, make conversation smooth, I think is always a great idea. I'm stopping because that was a massive information dump. <laughs> but I'd like to see you and talk to you about what your interests are and what your approaches are, because I know you have stuff that I haven't said. Wow. And thank thank you for great. listening. Thank you. That was wonderful. So many ideas in there. Uh, I'm gonna pipe down. We have a good turnout for today. So uh, I open it up to everybody. Please ask questions, speak thoughts. Hi, Diane. This is Lucy. Thank Lucy. you so much. That was really, really helpful. Gave a lot of ideas. I have maybe a silly question on, um, on using the polling feature. I see that 
I, you know, I saw that in the spring and I actually one time tried to use it and it didn't work. And then when I looked into it and they didn't notice, I actually log in twice as myself, once for my iPad and I share that as a screen and then once for my laptop. And then that's like the camera view of me so I can still gesture and things like that. I, that's super uh, cool. And I did notice, I, you know, whenever I log in twice on Zoom, it actually does say polling feature disabled. And so is there a way we can get two separate Zoom accounts or? Oh, so, so that's one that I would ask the technology design team. Um, William, could you, would you be willing to post a reference so people can contact them directly? Um, I haven't yet discovered that horror, but I would have shortly. So thank you. Okay. <laughs> so we are also talking twice into Zoom. One was a phone, one was a computer, but not using the same username. So one is just anonymous um, entering the Zoom meeting and one is logging with CU. Did that work? Yeah. <laughs> wow, cool. So I think if you log in yourself, they, they will disable one. But if you appear to be two person, that will work. Okay. We also have a Tech Friday coming up. I'm about to schedule all the ongoing going the distance lectures and Tech Fridays. And we have a Tech Friday coming up on Zoom. So that'll be a great place to attend or to watch the archived recording. And we'll encounter this question of the double account. Great. That's great. Yeah. So I, I had not experienced that yet, Lucy, but thank you for bringing that to our attention because that would be terrible. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, I got a question about Discord versus Slack. Um, I have used both for classes. Uh, Slack seems to be more uh, acceptable to a broader range of students. Discord still is very much a game communication tool. So what you end up with is a, is a pretty big disparity between the people who use it all the time and the people who have zero idea how to use it. Um, Slack is used in so many engineering firms uh, that there's also this kind of double win that you're training them to communicate in a medium they'll be using for an internship or a job at the same time that they're using it for class so that it feels like it's not a one-off uh, technology for them. So I, I actually, having tried both, I kind of prefer Slack. I, Discord is so much better if you wanna to speak to each other, but uh, Slack is a lot better if you're writing. Um, do I grade Slack contributions? I do. Yeah. So I'll start for an assignment. Every assignment has a channel and I will post the question or an image or video for them to watch and then they'll have to respond and then I'll go back and go through every single one and put my comments in the grade book. It doesn't integrate with Canvas directly. So that's an extra step. Um, but the, the responses I've seen in Slack were so much more robust than the responses in Canvas that it felt to me like it was worth that extra step. So is that all of the text questions? I think it might be. What else are you doing? Yeah, go ahead, Eileen. Thanks for all the information. That was great. Um, so my question is, I was in this learning collaboration focus group back in May. And one of the things they talked about was all the separate non-integrated tools caused confusion with students. So I was also going to use Slack and I was just wondering what you found using Zoom and Google Docs and Slack and was that a problem or how did you kind of integrate it or get that to work? Um, let's see, somebody's iPhone just connected. Yeah, there we go. Okay, good. We had an echo for a sec. Um, so obviously I, I would say try to keep it to a minimum. Um, if if there's any way for a department, like say you're an Atlas, if there's any way for a department or program to decide, all right, the thing we're all gonna use is, that will really help students in that program if you all try to use the same thing. Um, the fact that CS and computer in, in engineering was using uh, Moodle for everything was a big plus, I think, across the program. Um, I was using Slack for both the class and for a wrap that I was directing. 
So it was like their, their everyday lives plus the class. Um, but I think it's really important to get some buy-in to use it across different uh, classes in a department or, you know, everybody in every section of a multi-section course will use this tool. Um, everybody's fine with Google Docs in addition, but then as you start piling more things on, at this point I think everyone's fine with Zoom because they all had to use it in the spring. Um, but, uh, but definitely um, try, try not to use too many extra things, right? Like, I mean, I've used a couple of extra add-ons to do scavenger hunts before, which is great if you live with students, but I wouldn't want to do it to them if they were just in my class. Yeah. And I think CS also used Piazza or uses it. Have you used that at all? I tried it one year and wasn't a big fan personally, but if anybody's using it and, and thinks it has real affordances, please say something. I've, I've used it. I think it's, I think it's fine. Um, I, I think you have to be very careful with Piazza because it does have um, some anonymous posting options and you, you know, you have to, I, I think it's done on purpose, right? So that students could post a question and if they don't, you know, if they don't want people to know that they don't, they don't know that, then they can post anonymously. Um, but they can, you know, depending on how you have it set up, they could post anything anonymously. Um, so you do have to be a little bit careful with how you how you set up Piazza. I I mean I think it's. I, I all I can say is I think it's fine. I, I don't. I mean I've used Canvas discussion. I've used Piazza discussion. I I don't think Piazza is is so much better than the Canvas discussion forum. It's just another discussion forum. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that observation. That actually reminds me to say um, two quick things. One is um, for online interactive behavioral things, <laughs> which I know are a concern and we're certainly concerned in the spring. Um, I've been having students write social contracts at the beginning of class for decades. Like they have to come up with, these are the rules of engagement in our classroom and then everybody votes on them. Um, I use a Google, doc for this just as a wiki everybody can add to it um, you can pull things up in class and you can have them look at it but i think it's really important for them to establish what the rules are going to be for interaction um, when i have an in-person class i also always have online stuff so we have to write two contracts one for what we're going to be like inside the classroom and one for what we're going to be like in our online portion of the course um, and the second thing was just so important that I have no idea what it was. So I'll later, but um, yeah, okay. <laughs> there I, you are. I want to ask the question, <laughs> and then Chris had his hand up, and I want to let him speak. But Diane, following up on that social contract, how much time do you spend on that? Because I too use that, but I find that if I'm not careful, it turns into um, kind of. Uh, it, a legislative session of Congress, and it just sprawls, you know, well, week six on this bill. So um, how much time do you put on that social contract? And then I'll turn it over to Chris. Uh, so I introduce it in one class and we decide it in another. So it's, you know, the last five minutes of one class and then their assignment, their only homework is to contribute to a group document. And then the next class, I spend the entire class on it, and it has to be decided by the end. Um, I think you spend as much time as you think it's important, right? And to me, it's worth an entire class period to have them agree. Usually, we do this the end of the second week when everybody can already now see what the room feels like, right? Oh, and I remember now, thank you, what the other thing was I was going to say. Um, and that is... Um, it's really worthwhile to have them as part of that discussion, try to specify what they expect from their fellow students, right? I mean, that needs to be part of it. Like, what do I think participation means? Um, and then uh, usually I'll revisit it about mid-semester. Say, all right, how are we doing with our contract? Has anything changed? And I'll spend another X amount of time in a class on that so that, if people have revised their rules, they can revise their rules. If people want to say, 
you know, nobody is following the rules, they, they can do that. Um, in writing social contracts for in class, um, I've had students decide they don't want anyone to have their cell phones, like as a class. And then somebody brings a box and collects the cell phones. I don't touch them. <laughs> Um, you know, but I do tell them, I think it's actually important that you have your technology with you so you can learn how to resist it, <laughs> right? Yeah, Instead just of just to, having someone take it away, but I won't take it away. <laughs> I want to jump in there in response. Rhonda mentioned that OIEC in the chat is developing a contract. And I want to underscore Diane's technique is about participation. And, you know, giving the students a contract from OIEC and saying, you know, you are subject to this contract. That's about coercion. Giving the students license to make their own contract, I think is about reflection. Since I called Rhonda out, I'll let Rhonda speak. Yeah, so in their, in their part of their document is, here's how you get students involved in writing the social contract for your class. It's, hmm. it's not, here's a document, from OIC that tells people Good. how to get people to behave. I'm looking for the link now because what I received was a doc file, um, but I figure they must they must have a link somewhere on their website. I have an article in Educause that explains how to do this too. If anybody would like a link to that, great, that would be great. Chris, you've been very patient. I just want Hi, to Chris. Thank you. Hi, Diane. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, Thank you for your talk. I learned some things. Um, I wow. really enjoyed. <laughs> I enjoyed the map. I love that concept of visually showing students where they're going to journey in a classroom. And I'd love to learn more sometime about how you make it interactive on Canvas. But I have a, just three quick questions. One is, I how big is your class, typically your course? And is, did you do the Zoom part live or recorded or did you have an option? And my last question is embracing the chat. You start out with a distraction, but how did you, I guess, talk more about how you learned to embrace it um, and did you monitor it? So a lot of things in there, but get them all at once. Okay, great. Well, thank you. So uh, first answer is um, I, in the spring when we all had to go remote, um, I only had 18 students. Um, I have used most of these techniques though with classes of up to 200. So um, the, the course in particular, the meaning of information technology I've taught in the Atlas Auditorium full um, and coordinating an online and, a, and an in-person component. Um, okay, so that was the first question. Sorry. <laughs> the second question was <laughs> was the uh, was live versus recorded. Oh, right. How did you manage that aspect? Um, so I I did my spring class live, um, and uh, in large part because I was living in a dorm with students and hearing their concerns about their classes as they went online, and the people whose classes were asynchronous were not going they were not watching they were not doing they were they were disengaging because they needed some form of structure to their day so my daughter who was a first year student last this last year as well at CU um, did incredibly well in classes that were meeting synchronously she was always there um, really slacked off in classes that were not so you know I would I would urge to do as much synchronous work as possible um, or certainly if you're going to record lectures that you still do synchronous something, right? And, you know, if you're flipping the classroom and they're watching a lecture and then engaging in a live discussion, I would do something live. And my last one was just on the chat because I yeah, too that, was distracted by it. And then I started sort of like, okay, this is, I'm hearing the voices, but it's also still a, it is a, it's something to reckon with when you're trying to teach. Right. Well, I think, I mean, I started with fear because I attended a conference, an Educause conference, where people had the chat showing up streaming live on a big screen behind them. The, the speaker couldn't see the chat, but people were trashing the talk. And it was going on like the whole audience was just trashing this guy while he's talking. 
And I mean, this just left me with a gut punching sense of I will never, ever allow such things to happen to me. Um, so, you know, again, I think you have to establish what you want the chat to be for, right? Um, I preload a few topics that I want people to chat about and ask them otherwise just post questions. I mean, you can, you can tell them what you expect to see. Um, if you're recording, of course, they know that anything that is sent publicly or directly to you will show up in the recording. Um, the rumor, unfortunately, is false that if you're recording, you, you can also see the private conversations between other people. You can't, but I'm not going to mention that. <laughs> I think that rumor is useful. <laughs> um, so, but to me, it's actually the damage that can be done is when everybody sees a comment. Um, with a big class, I would want TAs to be moderating it and then to cue me to when there's something I need to pay attention to because there's already so much happening in a class that it's very hard. And especially once you have to scroll, it's over. You'll never see those earlier comments again. Thank you. Yeah. What the we, have, we have a number of classes in the fall that are going to be hybrid of of some you know whatever where where hybrid means something uh that is you know probably still to be defined um but for these classes that have it, this in-person component where it's you know some number of students that are attending every lecture and then there's some number that are going to be remote i can i can already see that we're going to we're going to have some issues where we've got students in a class where we're saying we'd like you to work together on this but you can't actually get close to each other um i'm just wondering if anybody has any thoughts on that like um you know how are we going to how are we going to address this situation of you know saying we've got students in the class but you have to i mean in some ways we might actually be better on zoom mm -hmm. than having them even in the classroom yeah, uh, I was thinking myself that I would actually maybe have them all bring laptops and and try to have them coordinate the I would be working close to you looking at the same thing conversations online rather yeah. than do them in person. Um, so uh, I think it's going to be a huge challenge, especially if they're required to wear masks, right? Um, mm -hmm. I can't understand anybody at the grocery store but the idea of not being able to understand people in my classroom is not great. Anybody else have a thought on that? And my understanding is also that the instructor needs to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Right. Um, the, you know, I think, uh, I did in the spring for a transition couple of weeks, have students who are both remote and in person. And um, I deployed an old computer <laughs> to broadcast them. I used an older laptop that pretty much was useless for anything but, show, but showing Zoom. And so I had them broadcast on a big screen so they were at least part of the conversation that was going on in person. Um, this may be something we're all going to have to do if we have in-person classes because we're going to have students who are out sick, whether mm -hmm. it's COVID or something else. And that, you know, seemed to be the only way to manage it so that they didn't just get totally mar marginalized. That's really interesting. I hadn't thought of projecting a Zoom session while I'm lecturing. And I think that's an interesting notion because I can't see demanding that everyone show up seems, seems just too risky. So that's an interesting, it's interesting. So we still have 10 minutes. Other thoughts, other reactions overall? Mary, well, go other, ahead. Other ideas for us too. I have a question. Diane, the information that you gave is incredible. I really appreciate it. It was very specific. I'm wondering, do you have a sample of an instructor who integrates many of your ideas on Zoom that you can share with us? 
I'd like well, to see some of this in action because there's a few things that I haven't used before and I'd like to see how the instructor integrates, for example, the whiteboard and the annotations and then how the Slack is integrated. Um, so uh, Chris <laughs> is one of the people I think who did the most amazing job with Zoom uh, in the spring. So that's one recommendation. Um, I am not teaching this fall because I'm coordinating a giant pilot project. Uh, good timing on that. So otherwise I would say come to my class and I'll, I'll show you what I do. But I'd be happy to set up just a demo uh, meeting if anybody okay. would like to just join as a group and, and, and try some things out. We can, we can try some things out. That would be great. We could post that on the Going the Distance. We could record it and post it as well. That's great. great. In fact, it would be kind of fun, Diane, if you wanted to teach us something. Uh, we could all engage as students around a topic. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. I did not use the whiteboard, uh, so I'm not an expert on that, but I have used some of the tools that um, that Diane referenced, but in maybe different ways, but I'm happy to help answer questions. But I too would like to learn how to use some of those whiteboard annotations. So. And do you have other, I mean, I just touched on some things here, but do you have other thoughts on um, any of these tools we have and how it could make education better overall? So I have used a Miro board and with students doing brainstorming, so they're kind of putting post it now, and so you see in real life how they organize it, putting labels, and so the whole session, just everybody participate with hundreds of post it board and organize into four or five different topics that they think will be useful. So I have done that a couple of times. Great. In real time, so that's really good. And then I have people doing like Google Doc editing at the same time as well, so when they're trying to share what's the project idea, so people start, writing things and then they start regrouping by themselves so I can watch it right. in real time. That's really fun. <laughs> yeah, the Google battle. It's really, it's really fun to watch. <laughs> Chris, you were going to say something else? Um, I, I'm trying to think the, uh, the Google polls. I totally agree. If you can work out all the clunkiness with them, they are a really great way, as you referenced, to keep people engaged. Um, and it's fairly easy to use as long as you're not over or stepping on yourself as a host. But um, do you mean the um, uh, the I'm Google sorry, Zoom polls? The Zoom polls. Okay, thanks. So, uh, as Mary said, I found this just invaluable for your concrete ideas of how to innovate the classroom. So, thank you. I thought that was wonderful. The map is great, and I'm going to explore that, how to map my own class in a visual way that makes my thinking clearer to my students, but also allows them to move between my ideas. Just, just brilliant work. As I reflected on it, your talk, it seemed to me that one through line, Diane, is a true sense of engagement as play that part of what you're looking for is not necessarily right answers to engagement, but a sense of play with the ideas and, and the tools that you're putting out. I wonder if in the last few minutes here, you could reflect a little bit about what you see as the relationship in teaching between play and content, between play and mastery, and what at the end of the course, you see as uh, the successful outcome of a class. Wow. Okay. So that's that's a book. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so all learning is play, right? Um, there's there's so much. There's so many things have been written about this uh, by this point, but. Um, you know, animals play to learn how to survive in the wild. Uh, children learn everything they learn through play. Um, and the problem for me in higher ed is that we've, we've kind of knocked the playfulness out of them by the time they've gotten through the college application process. <laughs> and they show up 
uh, having finally gotten into college and then everything's going to, nothing's going to live up to the horror show they've been through trying to get in. Um, and we have to reset their, their minds, right? We have to let them, we have to get them to understand that actually what experts do with knowledge is play with it, right? They recombine things. They, uh, they reach across fields. They uh, combine disparate things that they had never thought about before. And that's a very playful, creative experience. Um, most of these students have experienced flow, the Mihai Chick sent Mihai term uh, for being so engaged in something that you forget the passage of time, you forget to eat. Um, but a lot of them have had this experience only, say, in a video game uh, or you know an online world like World of Warcraft. Um, and actually, that's I get into flow if I'm reading a book that's really interesting, or if I'm working on my motorcycle, or you know there are all sorts of different ways to get engaged in complete and total concentration. And it's it's lovely, and and sociologists have shown that that's when we're happiest. It's not when we're relaxing. It's when we're working so hard and using every neuron to achieve something. So being able to show students that learning is play might actually get them through this pandemic, <laughs> but might also get them through life, right? If they, can, if they can approach everything as an opportunity to play, as opposed to you know, a, the next dredging horrible box to check, um, that actually could kind of reframe people's lives. So the medium is the message, right? If, if our medium is play, then I think they'll get the point that that's the way they should be looking at things. That's what, in engineering, that's what the Idea Forge was for, a space where you could show up and play with things and see other people playing with things and learn from them. So, I mean, that's my whole philosophical everything. That's why my course map looks like it does. It's a choose your own adventure. So that, that is just a profound summation of your lecture. All learning is play. And just to put a point on it, I think what you've shown us all is that Zoom, which seems like the most odious intermediary technology we could imagine to be dominating fall semester, in fact, is playful. That in your hands, using the chat function and the uh, screen sharing and the whiteboard and the background, you've made it into something playful. And that that to me turns everything on its head a little bit. Your provocation that your class was better on Zoom puts a really <laughs> fine point on that, that the challenge is out there to make our classes, even with Zoom, playful. Because all right. learning is play. Well, and you know, this is what engineers do is, as far as I'm concerned, is, is, is see something, try to figure out how it works, and try to figure out what you can do with it, right? Well, in a sense, that's how we have to approach Zoom or how we have to approach any teaching technology we're using. You know, how far can you go without breaking it? That's a really good thing to find out before you start teaching with it. Um, and, and you just, just, just mess with it as much as you can. And, and that's where most of these ideas came from, was just playing around. Well, that brings us to the half hour mark. So um, with that, I'm going to wrap us up. I want to thank you, Diane, for a lecture, which uh, a discussion and lecture, which did not disappoint. You are tremendously inspiring. And I think you've given us all something to think about in terms of invigorating our classes towards play. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank work. you. Good to see everybody. I appreciate your time.